Okay, uh, another member of the old guard, although that beats my introduction at ODI, where I'm part of the humanitarian cartel. Um, first, just a thanks for the report, and, and also for the idea that this is a series of reports, because I think, you know, what, what will evolve over time is the ability to compare apples with apples, and I think putting some rigor in that is, is extraordinarily valuable. Um, I want to pick up on what one of the one of the, the, the people stood up and said, and that is, you know, my biggest surprise in the report was the, the negative views from, from the recipients of aid themselves. Uh, and, and they're fairly startling, you know. It, it's roughly a third don't believe that aid, you know, not, not that they did, that it served partly their, their needs, but that it completely missed their most important needs, that it, they were completely unsatisfied with the quantity and completely unsatisfied with the quality. I mean, you know, the, the option to offer partly was there, and they didn't take that. Uh, and I find that fairly devastating in terms of news, and especially when you combine it with the fact these were aid recipients. And I think the far larger problem, of course, is the people who should be aid recipients and aren't aid recipients. And uh, that's in some ways one of MSF's chief concerns today. I mean, you know, it, it, there, there, there's the Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Sudan, those places where we would, we as an organization would, would expect to see much greater much greater operationality in terms of the needs on the ground and we aren't able to do it. Uh, Northern Mali, I mean, how many organizations are in Northern Mali right now? And again, that, that gets back to, you know, how do you, it, what is that balance between efficiency? We can go to Sierra Leone and, and do a whole lot more healthcare than we can in a place like Northern Mali. And what, what is the balance? What kind of resources do you need in headquarters to be able to do that? Uh, a second major concern is, of course, the, the Central African Republics, the Cote d'Ivoire, the places that aren't getting that kind of attention, or where we have programming, and then there's these small rapid onset things, you know, the, the cholera that affects three districts, the measles outbreak, those kinds of things that seem to be off the radar and beyond the response capacity of many organizations. Our main concern, though, uh, I think as an organization, is, is that what we see is a paradox between what, what, uh, John, what this report, what John Abbey just described as the growth of the system, you know, more money, more boots on the ground, and yet what we see is a decreasing capacity in terms of that surge capacity, that response to acute crisis, ability to upscale, uh, the ability to shift gears between programming that's ongoing in places and then is confronted with some kind of, some kind of crisis. And I think it's summed up in the report where people talked about the, the need, the overwhelming feeling of people and uh, recipients was the need for aid to be faster to start delivering aid. And when you look at that, I think, you know, on the surface, it's pretty easy to look at, uh, you know, basically staff and money. And I think the report does that to a certain extent, talking about how organizations are now increasingly having emergency rosters of people who can, who can depart on, on a rapid, uh, you know, sort of rapid onset basis. And then in, in terms of funding, and they look at SURF, and they look at the CHFs, and they look at some of the bilateral granting uh, procedures that are in the report. The one area where I think in the future, I would like to see the report uh, focus is also in the financial structures within organizations. I mean, we already know as an aid community that the money will be very difficult to get for rapid onset emergency. You know, the, the, the donors aren't going to give it right away. We aren't going to be able to launch appeals right away. It, it, it's very clear, unless we have a pool of money that we can use, and it has to be a considerable pool of money, it is going to be impossible for the humanitarian system to respond to a humanitarian crisis. It is a choice of organizations of how they structure their finances, and it's a choice that the, that the system overall, I think it would be a choice worth monitoring. To what extent do we have you know, the money for the, for the crisis and the money for the rainy day? Um, so you know, in, in some ways, the question that John just flashed up on the screen, why is, why is funding unequal? I think you would change to why is expenditure unequal? Uh, because it's not just about where funding is. I think that was the surface, I think underneath uh, you know, you can look at page 17 uh, of the report, and it talks about, you know, in addition to acute crisis, in acute, sorry, in addition to acute response, I can't read this, in addition to acute crisis response, the humanitarian system is also increasingly engaged in, and it talks about all that other stuff, disaster, repair, uh, disaster preparedness, DRR, resilience, and, and I want to be real clear, we all agree, everyone in MSF agrees, that's good stuff. But I don't agree that with this, with this suggestion that it's in addition to acute crisis response. Often, and I think what we need to look at is the extent to which it is in the place of acute crisis response, that humanitarian system is engaging in things that are much more of a much more long-term nature. And 
again, no, no, no judgment as to which is better, but to what extent are we now no longer able to respond because we're busy with humanitarian action that is for the future as opposed to doing something for right now. Um, and I think, it, 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 you know, taking the example, an MSF example, uh, when the Somali refugees came across the border in, uh, into the Liban camp, we sent in our emergency team. Uh, what ensued over the next few months was, uh, you know, in some ways could be described as, as a real nasty turf war, a very, very difficult engagement and, and relationship between our emergency team and our Ethiopia team that had been on the ground for quite a while. With, with recriminations back and forth and, uh, 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 about, you know, that one just doesn't understand the other. And I want to be clear, this is a turf war between cowboys and super cowboys. You know, that, that, that's essentially what we had a turf war. And I think when you start getting into other organizations, whether they're multi-context or multi-mandate, I think that, that that kind of war and that kind of, there are different ideologies, there's different ways of looking at things, there's different skill sets, there's different funding streams within organizations, there's different decision trees, there's just the authority and the ability and the flexibility to respond. And then there's, you know, the, the, the fact that many organizations now are working through partnerships and subcontracting. So that the implementation power of the organizations you see listed as the, the big, you know, the big actors in the humanitarian system are not necessarily able to change implementation on the ground in order to surge rapidly. Because we know everyone, everyone agrees with the idea of building the capacity of local, local actors, local, you know, local partners to surge. But right now they aren't able to, to deliver on that surge capacity and to respond. I think another element in this uh, is, is leadership. And I think the report does a good job at looking at UN leadership, and I'm wondering why isn't the report also look at NGO leadership? I mean, to what extent is aid itself now marginalized within the management team structures of the organizations that comprise the, the response? I mean, to what extent do we have organizations that on their website talk about, we will save lives through uh, uh, delivering medical care, and yet the medical director reports to somebody who reports to somebody in the management team? To what extent do we have field experienced people making decisions or ex-marketing managers from Tesco actually involved in making decisions because I think if you start looking at it and, and I think it's something that we should be able to track and say that the, the aid system needs to be, to be run by people who, who are in the business of aid and I think even within that what we hear from others who say even within the aid system we as humanitarians feel marginalized in our organization and i think that's something we've heard from other humanitarians in other organizations all right um so i guess it's, it's a question is the is the leadership structure and are, are our internal mechanisms fit for purpose fit for the purpose of humanitarian response and in particular uh, a response to acute crisis and lastly, I, I wonder, uh, you know, if all of this is actually evidence of a, of a much deeper uh, ideological rift in, in, in these organizations, whether really, you know, what we're talking about when, when, when the report defines systems, what the report talks about is, uh, you know, sort of broadly shared objectives. And I wonder to what extent we have broadly shared objectives if there really is, I believe, a, a tension or even a contradiction between the objective of do something for these people now and do something for these people that will be good for them in the future. And I, I, it, it actually, uh, there's, a great, there's a great sentence in the report on page 40, uh, 46, and I don't want to pick on multi-mandated agencies, but multi-mandated agencies also note that restrictions on the use of funding in rapid onset crises force them to prioritize response over long-term impact. And I wonder, what, what does that mean when the, the key component of the humanitarian system feels forced to, uh, to response rather than long-term, uh, deliver long-term long impact. Uh, that, at least from the report, I find that very worrying. So getting back to, you know, to John's question, I don't know where that falls on the convergence versus fragmentation scale, but I wonder if we're looking at a system. I wonder if the, you know, I, I think, I, I'm not suggesting that you construct another system and get another set of reports, but to what extent is this a system or is this really what we're looking at, a, a subsystem or a sector within a larger aid system and that larger aid system <coughs> Is you know devoted to well good things like development, things that we don't we don't really know about like stabilization and all the other factors and we are just uh, you know a subsector within that, and I will I will leave it there.
you know, one of the things I learned from Linda Tolman's book, which I expect is as uncontroversial as all the other things in her book, um, <laughs> is that Florence Nightingale hated the whole enterprise that Ali Dunar had started because she thought it just detracted from the responsibility of government to do it. And I'm, one of the things that we know MSF for is that you speak out. Um, I mean, do you suffer from ever that tension between the speaking out and just expecting somebody else to do it and doing it yourself? Um, I, I like to think that we speak out based on doing it ourselves, and we do have we have fairly major uh, battles within the organization about whether we have the legitimacy to speak on something unless we're active there. And, and, and Syria is a really good example. We have said some things on Syria where a lot of us would believe that's not really based on what we would consider an operational presence. Um, the other main concern is just, the, and, and, and I think it's far too simplistic, is uh, I think too many operational people would have would oppose the risks of speaking out versus you know your, your access on the ground uh, in, a, in a world where many governments are becoming much stronger and much more uh, directive towards humanitarian organizations. Okay, very good, thank you.